how many we have like 25 i think people will be joining it's 1202 now okay so as our point said let's begin for uh, today's uh, history and biology uh, seminar series and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today who is dr ellen ryan now for a few words of introduction of a scientist who has uh, dedicated his entire career to understanding how retroviruses are assembled from their component parts. So Dr. Ellen uh, Ryan obtained his bachelor in science degree from Reed College in Oregon. His PhD with Dr. Harry Rubin at the University of California, Berkeley. And he did his postdoctoral research as an American Cancer Society fellow under the direction of Dr. Sheldon Penman at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Ryan has been associated with the National Cancer Institute, NCI, since 1976. His research has dealt with a number of aspects of the biology and molecular biology of murine and human retroviruses, including virus assembly and maturation, viral envelope function, translational suppression, and pathogenesis. He served as head of the retroviral genetics section in the ABL basic research program from 1984 to 1999. In 1999, he joined the HIV Dynamics and Replication Program of NCI as head of the Retrovirus Assembly section and was also appointed to the prestigious NCI Senior Biomedical Research Service. Dr. Ryan received the NIH Director's Award in 2012 and in 2014, he was elected Fellow of the American Society of Microbiology. He has that connection with Johns Hopkins faculty as well. In 2011, he received a two-year breast cancer research program grant from the Avon Foundation for women to support a collaborative project on testing for MMTV and related retroviruses in breast cancer with Dr. Edward Gabrielson. And he closely collaborated with Dr. Angelo Di Marzo to debunk the story of XMRV involvement with prostate and other cancers. On a personal note, allow me to mention that he has had a happy spousal collaboration with our own Dr. Sarah Sukumar for the last 25 years. And in 2012, uh, Dr. Ryan was also awarded a three-year program grant from the Human Frontier Science Program to support an international collaboration on physics principles in the self-assembly of immature HIV, part HIV-1 particles. Dr. Ryan has organized many key meetings throughout his career and recently was a keynote speaker at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Retroviruses Meeting. He's currently on the editorial boards of Journal of Virology and Journal of Biological Chemistry. He's also the co-editor of the Viruses Special Issues in memory of Stephen Orsuzaran and Molecular Genetics of Retrovirus Replication, respectively. For NCI, he has served on the Center for Cancer Research CCR Tenure Re Review Panel from 2006 to 2017 and currently serves as a member of CCR RNA Biology Initiative. He's also a collaborative member of the HIV Interaction and Viral Evolution Center, a consortium of leaders in the field of HIV research who are applying their structural functional knowledge of drug resistance evolution to the design of more effective anti-HIV treatment. So without further ado, let me hand over the Zoom podium to Dr. Alan Ryan. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Ryan, and Mike is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, people see the screen okay? Are we in business? Okay, uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here. I have been looking forward to giving this talk. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, a bit of a history of the field of retrovirology, which I have been in since the early 1960s and a bit of where we are today. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose, and I will not be discussing non-FDA approved drugs or products. Um, <clears throat> and I want to say I, I would be delighted to get 
to be interrupted for questions. Um, and if you ask me questions and I answer them, the talk may run a little over an hour, but um, if that's okay with you, that's okay with me. Uh, so my intentions are this sketch of a history of retrovirus research and talk about some aspects of HIV biology. Those are the main elements in the talk. So the field begins uh, near the beginning of the 20th century um, when Peyton Rouse um, discovered that he could grind up a chicken tumor, a particular chicken tumor, make a cell-free filtrate from it, inject it into a new chicken, and the chicken would rapidly develop a tumor at the site of inoculum. Furthermore, um, that tumor in turn could be ground up and filtered and put into still more chickens, and they would also develop tumors. In other words, the tumor-inducing agent was serially transmissible. This was Rouse sarcoma virus. Um, the field was, you know, very limited uh, to qualitative observations like this um, for many years. Uh, I just want to emphasize what a dramatic observation it is. I mean, infection of the cells with the virus directly, drastically changes the properties of the cells. The cells change their properties from normal to malignant over a course of a few days. As I was saying, the field was um, limited by the available techniques and um, qualitative nature. It was found that you could get tumors not only in intact chickens, but also on the chorioallantoic membrane of chicken eggs. But finally, um, a groundbreaking uh, event was the introduction of a real in vitro infectivity assay. So Howard Temin and Harry Rubin, uh, working at Caltech in the late 50s under the auspices of Renato Del Becco, worked out the conditions under which uh, chick embryo fibroblast monolayer cultures could be infected with Rouse sarcoma virus, and they would develop discrete foci of transformed cells, which could easily be counted. And the key thing about this is the number of foci of transformed cells is linear with virus dilution, as shown in the graph. That means each focus is induced by infection with a single particle of Rouse sarcoma virus. This is now an assay which can be used to quantitate the uh, the amount, the activity of the, the sarcoma virus preparation. And I want to emphasize at this time, you know, around 1960, there was no other way of detecting the virus. There were no biochemical assays. There were no <clears throat> southern blots, western blots, PCR uh, sequences, et cetera, et cetera, that we all take for granted today. The way you knew the virus was there was because it could transform cells. And the way you knew how much virus you had was from how many foci you got in this assay. However, this assay actually um, was used to learn some remarkable things about the virus. Here are Dr. Rubin, my PhD mentor, and Howard Temin, who worked with him at that time. I should also say that although the story I'm telling right now is about avian viruses, there were somewhat parallel developments in with mouse viruses in mice. So when, during the course of using this focus assay, uh, Rubin discovered that there are other viruses which don't make foci, are, not, are, are invisible in this focus assay, except if cells are pre-infected with these other viruses, they become resistant to focus formation by Rouse sarcoma virus. So the first one, uh, which he published in 1960, uh, he called resistance inducing factor. It was actually found in 
uh, chickens from a poultry farm. And so that kind of expanded the way that the assay could be used. Then, um, uh, so it was then found in, in working with Rouse sarcoma virus stocks that actually these stocks contain two viruses that they contain not only Rouse sarcoma virus, but a second virus, which was called RAV, Rouse associated virus, which again was detected because pre-infection with RAV makes cells resistant to focus formation by Rouse. Obviously, when it was learned that there are two viruses in this stock, this stock is actually a mixture. It was then important to sort things out. What are, what are the two viruses? What are their respective properties? And so it, by diluting the virus stock to the dilution endpoint, it was possible to isolate cells infected with only one of the viruses. And when this was done, it was found that Rouse sarcoma virus was replication defective, unable to reproduce itself. It can only grow if a RAV is also present in the cell to complement its replication defect. This was a really big surprise um, and was described in this beautiful paper in PNAS in 1963. Uh, here is my little picture um, in case you didn't get it from the words. There are two viruses in the Rouse sarcoma virus stock. One of them uh, induces cell transformation, that's Rouse sarcoma virus. And the other does not induce transformation, but um, can reproduce itself. Uh, that's RAV. And in fact, if both viruses are present in the same cell, then you will get progeny virus of both Rouse and RAV. And of course, um, so this was done by Ruben together with Peter Vogt, um, who was a wonderful postdoc, uh, who went on to a really a tremendous career. He is actually still active in the field, still productive in the field. He was just leaving the lab when I arrived in 1962 and by Saburo Panafusa, who did this work while I was there. Uh, he unfortunately died about 10 years ago. They were both, one, the, all three, wonderful scientists. Um, and, and of course, now we understand, this explains why RAV is present in a stock of Rouse sarcoma virus. Um, you will not get infectious Rouse sarcoma virus unless a second virus is also present to complement its defect in replication. It turns out that Rouse is not unique. There are actually dozens of viruses like it. They were generically called RNA tumor viruses or acute transforming viruses. They share the ability to induce cancer rapidly. And except for one unique isolate of Rouse sarcoma virus, they are all, like what I've been telling you, replication defective. Apparently, when a virus acquires the ability to transform cells, in general, it loses the ability to reproduce itself. Um, then there are a large number of related viruses um, called, among other things, avian leukosis viruses, murine leukemia viruses, which do not directly transform cells. They do not induce malignant transformation in a matter of days, but when injected into a susceptible host, such as a chicken or mouse, as the case may be, they do induce uh, lymphoid malignancies of one kind or another over a course of months. They do this by a different mechanism, which is also interesting and informative. I will get back to this briefly towards the end of the talk. So what are these viruses like? Um, They are roughly spherical. They are 100 or 120 nanometers in diameter, more or less. They contain RNA. They're enclosed in a lipid bilayer, which is actually a bit of plasma membrane from the cell that produced them. But how they re reproduce themselves was a complete mystery for many years. 
And when I say many years, I really mean the 1960s. In the 1960s, uh, the mechanisms of replication of many RNA viruses began to be revealed. That is, for many RNA viruses, it was possible to infect the cell with <clears throat> the virus, then break open the cell and find in, in cell lysates replication complexes, uh, essentially replication intermediates of one kind or another. Uh, and we began to understand something about how many viruses, many RNA viruses replicate themselves. But this was not true of what were called RNA tumor viruses. Here, there was nothing but confusion and controversy. Uh, the virus went into the cell, it changed the cell, it might produce progeny virus, but what happened inside the cell remained a mystery, remained a black box. And this uh, mystery was really dispelled by a single uh, discovery, and that was the discovery of reverse transcriptase, viral RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, uh, which was reported, really discovered simultaneously in 1970 by David Baltimore and again, Howard Temin. And this discovery really transformed the field and I'm gonna say a few words about it. First of all, about the experiment itself, demonstrating the presence of this enzyme. Um, I, this, and this experiment is so simple, I think the hardest part of this experiment was deciding to do it. And the experiment is simply, you take virus, a preparation of virus, you lyse the virus particles with mild detergent, you add radioactive deoxynucleoside triphosphates, and you incubate, and you look for uh, the incorporation of those radioactive DNTPs into high molecular weight form. That's it. Um, it is the enzyme which is catalyzing polymerate, polymerization of DNA into high molecular weight form. So the experiment is simple. Why was it done when it was done? This is an interesting question, and I think there are two different answers. So again, to pack back up to the 1960s or earlier, um, when I was growing up, before most of you were born, um, we were taught that a virus particle <clears throat> is a package carrying nucleic acid. And it's like a, a truck delivering a cargo and the cargo is nucleic acid. That was a virus particle. And in the 1960s, slowly, uh, it, was some, it was realized that, well, yes, true, but some viruses also contain one or more enzymes in the virus particle, in addition to the nucleic acid. And David Baltimore was very involved in this whole story of um, finding the enzymes and ultimately working out the logic um, of why one virus will carry one enzyme, another virus will carry a different enzyme, and one virus may not need an enzyme. Uh, he actually had been studying replication of RNA viruses for quite some time before then, and he really made tremendous contributions to this area and, as I say, brought clarity, brought some logic to uh, a whole field of observations. I'll mention, I'll describe that in a minute. Howard Temin, on the other hand, so that was his background. That, that's what led him to try to see if maybe possibly there was in these so-called RNA tumor viruses an enzyme that could synthesize DNA. Howard Temin, on the other hand, so as I mentioned, he had been involved with Rubin in the initial pioneering studies of Rouse sarcoma virus. And he made the imaginative leap. He said, look, I know the virus has RNA, but it comes into the cell and it induces a permanent heritable change in the cell. He says that that change must be somehow stamped on the cell's DNA. I don't know exactly how, but 
Although it's an RNA virus, I think it changes the DNA of the cell. And uh, he, he published a number of papers um, supporting this hypothesis during the 1960s. Uh, the, the data in the papers was not very convincing. It was complicated. Um, by the way, I haven't gotten any questions yet. I'll remind you, I encourage questions. But as I was saying, um, he was really a voice crying in the wilderness. No one really believed his claim that although it's an RNA virus, it, it somehow brings new DNA to the cell. And he didn't really know how it was done until he did this experiment. Um, so that is the background that he brought to this experiment. And the implications of this discovery? Well, there are many implications. Um, first of all, it changed the field of studying these viruses overnight. And, you know, if, if I look back on the history of the field, I can divide the history into before and after uh, the discovery of reverse transcriptase. When reverse transcriptase was discovered, it was like, okay, <laughs> You know, we didn't believe it, but okay, the virus actually comes into the cell, brings its RNA, and brings this enzyme, which copies that RNA into DNA, a DNA copy. And it is that DNA copy which takes up residence in the cell and is responsible for the changes in the cell induced by the infection. And uh, people, you know, the, the great discovery of the previous few decades was DNA makes RNA. And now you're telling me RNA makes DNA? That violates the central dogma, people said. Although Francis Crick said, it doesn't violate the central dogma. He said, I never said that. The central dogma, according to Crick, who ought to know, is that information flows from nucleic acids to proteins and cannot flow in the reverse direction from proteins back to nucleic acids. But he said, I never said that information cannot flow from one nucleic acid to another in either direction. Uh, so as, as I say, uh, it really brought clarity to the whole field. Um, and of course, from that day forth, we now call them retroviruses. Now that we understand information actually does flow from RNA to DNA in the replication of these viruses. Another implication I should just mention is, of course, we it's a standard reagent now in molecular biology to have to use reverse transcriptase to make cDNAs from cellular mRNAs. And in 1970, uh, splicing had not yet been discovered and we didn't appreciate how different the messenger RNA uh, encoding a protein in the cytoplasm would be from the gene that produced that mRNA and how important it would be to to get your hands on mRNAs per se. I mean, the, the genomic copies of the genes uh, are limited in what they can tell you about mRNAs. Um, the ability to copy RNA into DNA also has implications for the origin of life, but I won't get into that today. Okay. Uh, Obviously, uh, that was a long time ago and many new techniques, molecular techniques have been developed in the ensuing 50 years. And we've since learned a great deal about the molecular mechanisms of retrovirus replication. And I'm going to walk through the replication cycle um, using this very crude cartoon um, as a didactic device. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is this is a cycle. This is a circle. Each step in this cycle depends on the preceding step and is required for the following step. 
uh, like with any circle, um, if you break it anywhere, you have broken the circle. And so any step in this cycle is a potential therapeutic target. Um, also, by the way, a circle really has no beginning and no end. And where you start talking about it is an arbitrary choice. But I'll start, um, I'll call this the beginning of, of this sequence of events. So as I told you, uh, are there any questions? Yes, there's a question in the chat box from uh, Dr. Scott Kern, who asked, were these avian tum tumors benign, not metastatic, metastatic, or malignancies capable of spontaneous metastasis? So that was uh, a question. I, uh, I am not a pathologist, but I am quite sure they were malignant. Yeah, I had another question, which was mostly on the evolutionary, or one of the evolutionary things, which I, when I often think about the RNA viruses or the DNA viruses, what was the evolutionary, evolutionary forces thinking if there were evolutionary forces before switching to RNA? Like, what would be the advantage of having RNA as a genetic material when it has to be made into cDNA into the cell before uh, even proceeding further? Is that um, a rapid translation or... Because RNA in general is more unstable than the DNA molecule. So they are well, okay. Uh, risk. I, I think I would answer that question by saying, why are there both dogs and cats? Um, the, the world of living things has, has endless diversity and, um, you know, e each... Each form that we see before us has been able, using whatever strategies it uses, to survive. Um, and, uh, you know, us humans, I don't think we're capable of understanding the advantage. Um, um, but, but it's there. And it's there that tells us that it has succeeded. Um, Thank you. And uh, there is a question, did the discovery of Rouse sarcoma virus uh, direct cancer research for a long time by chasing the viral origin of tumors? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, it certainly was very influential in the direction of cancer research, and I'll get to that. But uh, the viral origin of tumors. Uh, I, I think I'm going to run out of time um, trying to answer that question. So we can wait <laughs> but, till the end. If you no, you don't have to wait to the end. It's okay. 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 Please, please interrupt me. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so uh, retro life cycle you can think of it as beginning when the virus enters a new cell. So the virus, as I said, has RNA and protein enclosed in a membrane, a lipid bilayer. There are virus-coded glycoproteins projecting through that membrane, and they are looking for receptors on the surface of a new host cell. When they encounter those receptors, they will in induce fusion of the membranes so that the contents of the virus are deposited in the cytoplasm of the new host cell. Those contents include um, uh, seems to be frozen. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so the contents include both RNA and the enzyme I was just talking about, reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase copies the RNA into a double-stranded DNA copy in the cytoplasm of the new host cell. That DNA copy makes its way into the nucleus of the new host cell by mechanisms that are still under very active investigation and differ very significantly from one retrovirus to another. When it's in the nucleus, 
that double-stranded DNA is then physically inserted into the chromosomal DNA of the host cell by the enzyme integrase, which is one more enzyme that was actually brought into the cell in the virus particle and has accompanied the DNA um, from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And uh, where in the chromosomal DNA it inserts that copy is almost random. I mean, viruses have kind of limited preferences as to what kind of site they like, um, but you can think of it as virtually random. Uh, it will insert almost anywhere in the 3 billion base, base bear sequences in a haploid human genome. Once it's there in the nucleus of the cell, it's then you have now added a, a few genes to the gene complement of the host cell. And these genes are in effect cellular genes. They are to a first approximation expressed like other cellular genes. So they are transcribed by Paul II. The transcripts have a cap at their five prime end and poly A tails at their three prime end. They may or may not be spliced. Uh, they are exported to the cytoplasm and some of them are then translated on ordinary, poly, uh, ordinary ribosomes. Um, other RNA molecules are exported to the cytoplasm, not translated. The viral proteins um, produced by translation of the viral messages then assemble into progeny virus particles, which bud out of the cytoplasm of, of the new host cell. They package uh, viral RNA molecules, and eventually they are released. They bud off the surface and are released as what's called an immature virus particle. Finally, the viral virus-coded protease, which is also present in the immature particle, cleaves those viral proteins, converting the immature particle into the mature infectious particle, ready to begin the new cycle of infection. Uh, and it's important to understand that the immature particle is completely non-infectious. These cleavages are absolutely required for viral function. Okay, so keep in mind then, Replication requires three virus-coded enzymes, the protease, the reverse transcriptase, and integrase. This maturation brought about by the cleavage of the proteins in the immature particle is not just a little refinement, it is a complete reorganization of the structure of the particle, and again, is absolutely required for infectivity. Okay. Uh, Another milestone, of course, was the discovery of oncogenes in these viruses. So around 1970, um, Peter Duisberg and Peter Vogt and others used quite what for us today, 50 years later would be very crude methods to map, uh, map the, the RNAs, the genomic RNAs that were in those virus particles. And they found that RAV, so again, that's a virus that cannot transform cells, and Rouse, their genomes were quite similar, except that Rouse had additional sequences at its three prime end. And they suggested these additional sequences carried the transforming activity, the oncogenic activity of Rouse sarcoma virus. And that was right. These extra sequences turned out to be the SARC gene in Rouse sarcoma virus. This, of course, was a transformation in the field, of course. Um, you know, many people had been studying these viruses because of the remarkable ability to convert normal cells into tumor cells directly over a space of a few days. These were the switches that these viruses were carrying. And once these genes, the viral oncogenes were identified, many people did not need the viruses anymore. And 
stop, the, stop studying the viruses and proceeded to study the oncogenes. One obvious question uh, was where did the oncogenes come from? This was answered by Bishop and Varmus, um, basically doing subtractive hybridization. They found, um, interestingly, the oncogenes that were found in retroviruses come from cellular genes, what we call proto-oncogenes that have been captured by the viruses. These are genes that normally function in growth control, although in many cases, the version of the gene, the viral oncogene present in the transforming virus is not identical to the uh, gene present in normal cells, the parent parental gene, for example, SARC. So the SARC gene in Rouse sarcoma virus is derived from the SARC gene in cells, but it is changed and uh, that's involved in its transforming activity. In some transforming viruses, uh, the gene may be normal, but expressed at abnormally high levels or in times or places where it's not normally expressed. Um, I would like to ask your indulgence for if I'm going to say a few words about viruses in general um, and where retroviruses fit in the larger world of viruses in general. I feel that the diversity in the world of viruses is not properly appreciated. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, these are replication strategies of viruses. And if you can imagine it, a virus does it. Um, so all there are a few commonalities. All viruses must make mRNAs um, so that the cell can use these instructions to make the proteins needed to make baby viruses. And as far as I know, all viruses copy nucleic acids by the same Watson Crick rules uh, that we are all too familiar with. But having said that, um, I will just say there are all these all these possibilities actually exist in the world of viruses. So some viruses actually carry double-stranded DNA into the cell. They include smallpox, herpes virus, human papillomavirus, and many other viruses. In this case, there's nothing too mysterious about this. The cell knows uh, that when it finds double-stranded DNA, it should be transcribed into MR to make mRNA as, as needed. So these viruses, the logic is relatively simple. It's just bringing in some more genes. However, other viruses bring into the cell, the virus particle contains only a molecule of single-stranded DNA. These include parvoviruses, which are important pathogens in dogs, cats, and many other animals. In turn, this single-stranded DNA may be the strand, which is identical in polarity to the messenger RNA that will eventually be, be made. This would be called the plus strand. Or the particle may contain a single-stranded DNA, which is complementary to the messenger RNA. This would be called minus strand DNA. And in fact, in some parvoviruses, all the particles have plus strand. In some parvoviruses, all the particles have minus strand. And in some parvoviruses, a, vir a virus preparation will be a mixture. Some particles will have plus strand and some will have minus strand. In any case, when, plus, when a single-stranded DNA molecule is found, it will be copied into uh, a double-stranded DNA version, uh, and this will be done by cellular machinery. The cell knows how to do this. And this double-stranded DNA will then be the template for the needed mRNAs. However, other viruses bring into the cell different RNAs. Now, here things get uh, more complicated because the point is the cell does not normally copy RNA into RNA. And so if the replication strategy of a virus 
well, all replicate, all RNA viruses require copying of RNA into RNA. And since cells don't have the machinery to do that, the viruses must supply that machinery in order to replicate. Uh, so some viruses, rheoviruses and rotaviruses, bring into the cell double-stranded RNA. And again, the cell doesn't, doesn't know what to do with double-stranded RNA, so those virus particles must also encode and bring into the cell a polymerase to make RNA from this double-stranded RNA. And specifically, these viruses actually maintain their double-stranded RNA, but produce and release into the cytoplasm um, the plus strand messenger RNA needed to kick off the infection and to make the infection go. Then other RNA viruses uh, carry RNA, which is actually the coding strand. So these viruses are actually carrying into the cell a messenger RNA. <clears throat> and um, once that messenger RNA is deposited in the cytoplasm, it will be translated and that kicks off the infection. And so these viruses, <clears throat> although they must encode a polymerase to make, to copy RNA into RNA, to make baby copies of plus strand RNA uh, using some minus strand as a template, um, they don't need to bring the polymerase into the cell, they encode it. These so-called plus strand RNA viruses include many important pathogens, poliovirus, hepatitis C, and its relatives, the flaviviruses and coronaviruses. <clears throat> then many RNA viruses actually bring into the cell an RNA, but it is not the messenger RNA it needs. It is complementary to the RNA that it needs. These are so-called minus strand or negative strand RNA viruses. They again include many very significant pathogens, influenza virus, Ebola virus, respiratory syncytial virus, and many others. And <clears throat> obviously, uh, since the cell has no idea what to do with this RNA, the virus particle must also bring in the polymerase necessary to copy the genomic minus strand RNA into messenger RNAs needed to make the infection go. Then some vi virus particles bring into the cell a molecule of RNA, which is the coding strand, but they replicate through a DNA intermediate. That's the retroviruses I'm talking about today. And of course they bring into the cell the polymerase needed to copy that RNA into DNA. That's the reverse transcriptase I've been talking about. And finally, some viruses bring into the cell double-stranded DNA, but they replicate through an RNA intermediate. So this is essentially the same replication cycle as retroviruses, except that the extracellular phase of that cycle is in double-stranded DNA rather than RNA. These include hepatitis B virus, sometimes called a pararetrovirus. I also, just one more way of looking at the world of viruses is um, to consider the diversity in complexity. And one way of assessing the complexity, of course, is the size of the genome. And viral genomes vary over at least a thousand fold range from tiny viruses which contain, whose genomes are only a couple of thousand bases, only coding for one or two proteins, up to viruses uh, whose genomes are more than a million and encode for hundreds of proteins. In this continuum, retroviruses are towards the simpler end of the continuum, but not at the simplest end. Um, it's interesting to note that um, the largest RNAs known in nature are those in coronavirus particles. Those are around 30,000 bases. Uh, and all those strategies I was just showing you, all the various crazy things viruses think up, those are all in this range, coronavirus or smaller. 
Above 30,000, all genomes are only double-stranded DNA. Okay, um, moving right along, another milestone in the field, which um, unfortunately I don't need to tell you what it is. In the early 80s, um, people started showing up with a previously unknown syndrome. Um, essentially, the immune system had collapsed and people were developing any of a wide variety of opportunistic infections or Kaposi's sarcoma uh, and uh, invariably dying of these opportunistic infections. And um, I, I cannot uh, overemphasize how frightening this was. Um, there was no precedent for this new syndrome. Um, you could look in the textbooks they were no help. Textbooks didn't tell you what was going on here. The victims in the US tended to be homosexual men, although they were also included uh, hemophiliacs who had been treated with blood products or people just unfortunate enough to need routine transfusions, blood transfusions. Um, and as I say, no one knew what was causing this terrifying new disease and no one knew what to do about it. And so this is uh, the annual rate of death um, in the US from 1987 until 1994. And as you can see, it showed every indication of going through the roof and it, it would have gone through the roof except that the virus causing this disease was isolated and it was isolated by Francoise Barre uh, in Luc Montagnier's lab in Paris. Uh, and they cultured lymphoid tissues, not only from people suffering from this disease, but from people at risk for the disease. And this was quite important in identifying the causative agent because of course, once you have no more good immune system, your, your tissues may be full of any passenger opportunistic that virus that comes along, but this virus was present even before AIDS acquired immune deficiency syndrome had really set in. And so they isolated this virus. It looked like a retrovirus in the electron microscope. Uh, cells, um, it could be transmitted, could be cultured, um, in human T cells. And uh, these cultures produced a virus that labeled with uridine, that is contain RNA. It contained reverse transcriptase activity, the hallmark of retrovirus particles. Particles also banded in a sucrose gradient at the characteristic buoyant density of retrovirus particles. And so, as you know, this was HIV, the causative agent of AIDS. Uh, this is Francoise who did this work. Once it was recognized as a retrovirus, the path to therapy was relatively clear. As I already told you, retroviruses were known to contain three enzymes, each essential for retrovirus replication. And so academia and big pharma went to work and developed inhibitors first of reverse transcriptase, then also inhibitors of protease, and finally, quite a bit more recently, inhibitors of integrase. Uh, to successfully treat the disease requires simultaneous administration of three inhibitors. I'll discuss that in a minute. Anyway, when this so-called triple therapy, highly active antiretroviral therapy was introduced in the mid nineties, the death rate fell like a stone. And um, it's, I think, rather miraculous <clears throat> that the virus was isolated in 1983, reported in 1983, and already by 1995, uh, measures had been developed to bring the infection under control. And uh, I must add, I am, I am, this is a personal note, I am a basic researcher, that is, my experiments are not necessarily devoted to questions of immediate public health interest. 
And uh, I would ask you to try and imagine if when this new disease showed up, the prior research that I talked to you in the first half of the talk had not been done, people would have had no idea what to do. And it would have taken a lot longer than 12 years to develop therapies if they had to figure out what kind of virus it was first and how this virus reproduced itself. Okay, so uh, the bottom line I am trying to say is this is a perfect demonstration of the value of basic research. When this new disease came along, which could never have been anticipated, um, there was some intellectual preparation. It, it was possible to mobilize in short order because of prior research on animal viruses. Okay, I'm now going to spend most of the rest of the talk um, talking about how HIV makes a living, it's strategies of survival, strategies by which HIV successfully reproduces itself. Are there any questions before I switch gears here? Okay. So this is a graph of what happens when a person is infected by HIV. And I'm showing you two time courses here. One, the colored line is the virus load, the level of virus in the blood. <clears throat> and the other is um, the CD4 count, an indicator of the health of the immune system. So when a person is infected initially by HIV, uh, the level of the virus rises very rapidly in the first few weeks to as high as 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh virus particles per mil. This is the, called the acute phase of infection. The virus load then drops to an intermediate level, which is sometimes called set point. Uh, and this is period is now clinical latency. That is the person, the virus load is constant for a period, it can be as much as 10 years. The person doesn't feel sick. Uh, the person, of course, is capable of transmitting the virus uh, to his partners or her partners. <clears throat> and then finally, the latent period comes to an end. Um, essentially, the immune system collapses as indicated by the CD4 count, which declines slowly over this period of many years and then drops to nothing. The immune system collapses and the person will then succumb to one of a wide variety of possible opportunistic infections and or Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, <clears throat> so what's going on during this latent, so-called latent period which the steady state, which lasts for many years. It turns out uh, that this steady state, steady level of virus is actually maintained by extremely rapid infection and death of infected cells. And this is clear from this following simple experiment. If you treat a person in, in that steady state with a drug which stops infection, stops virus replication, and just monitor the amount of virus in the blood. You will see that the amount of virus in the blood drops first with a half-life of about a day. After a period of about a week, the slope of the curve changes, and now the, the half-life with which it drops is more like a week instead of a day. But in any case, this tells us that the steady state level of the virus in the blood is actually a result of massive turnover. Cells are infected, release progeny viruses, and die by the billions every day. A reasonable estimate is that there are 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th infections per day during that steady state period. Note, uh, this treatment reduced the level of virus more than a thousand fold, but unfortunately, when the treatment is continued, the level of virus does not continue to drop, but levels off at a new very low level. In fact, so low 
that it was undetectable by the first commercially released virus assays. And so it was believed for some time that there was no virus in the blood after, after treatment. But more sensitive assays do detect virus in the blood. It may be in the neighborhood of 10, 20, 50, 5, 2 viruses per mil of blood, vanishingly low levels, but it's there. In, in other words, somewhere in the body, there are cells that are not killed by the virus, but can't, but retain the ability to release virus indefinitely. And so obviously continuous treatment maintains the virus at a very low level, um, which means a person maintains a healthy immune system and means the person will not transmit the virus to his partners uh, or her partners, but it doesn't go away. The reservoir remains, that is if treatment is stopped, the tiny amount of virus present in the blood will spread uh, unchecked and will rebound again to a high level. So this is not a cure and treatment must be maintained. Um, successful treatment must be maintained in order for the person to live a normal life. Furthermore, the great difficulty with antiviral therapy and the reason that simultaneous treatment with three drugs is necessary is drug resistance. So I told you there is an extraordinarily high level of virus replication going on every day in an infected individual. And furthermore, when reverse transcriptase copies RNA into DNA during each of those infections, 10 to the eighth, 10 to the ninth per day, it's pretty sloppy, it makes some mistakes. And so in any infected individual, there are many co mutant copies of the viral genome. In fact, very likely any possible single mutant of those 10,000 bases in the viral genome any possible single mutant is already present. Among those thousands of possible mutants, there are mutants which are resistant to any known inhibitor. So when you treat with any single in inhibitor, what's called monotherapy, you rapidly select from mutant viruses that are already present and resistant to the inhibitor. For example, um, this is, a real life example. So there is a drug called 3TC, one of the good inhibitors of reverse transcriptase. But if you treat with 3TC alone, uh, it, it successfully inhibits uh, reverse transcription by wild type reverse transcription, re reverse transcriptase. But somewhere in the body, there are some viruses in which uh, position 184 of reverse transcriptase has not the methionine codon characteristic of wild type reverse transcriptase, but isoleucine. If it's got an isoleucine, it is somewhat resistant to 3TC and will start to grow somewhat. And furthermore, um, it will generate mutants now with a valine rather than isoleucine at 184. Uh, these mutants are essentially resistant to 3TC and um, you are right back where you started. Uh, so, so that is why uh, in order to successfully treat the infection, you need to have three inhibitors present simultaneously uh, because it is the probability of having a virus in the person which is simultaneously carrying resistance mutations against three inhibitors is vanishingly small. And so that is how highly active antiretroviral therapy works. Uh, I'm now gonna switch gears again and just close with a few remarks about these topics of other, other areas of interest. Um, so again, any questions? Uh, anybody would like to ask. Um, okay, uh, so I'm just going to first say just a word about insertional mutagenesis. So 
And again, um, some retroviruses, I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, some retroviruses do not contain oncogenes and do not transform cells directly. However, they do cause malignancies over a time span of months. They, these include what we call murine leukemia viruses and avian leukosis viruses and many others. And it turns out, so you remember that when integrase is inserting a proviral DNA into the chromosomal DNA of the host, it chooses that site essentially at random. And when a host is viremic, that means there are millions of infections going on every day, each one choosing a new site practically at random. And it turns out that these malignancies um, caused by these non-transforming viruses are actually caused by integration of the proviral DNA in or near cellular growth control genes, disrupting the genes or causing their misexpression. This is uh, what I mean by insertional mutagenesis of the cell by retroviruses. And um, some oncogenes, in fact, have been identified as because they are common integration sites in virus-induced lymphomas. Is this clear? Uh, another very important area in contemporary virus research is uh, the study of restriction factors. So it's become clear in recent years that vertebrates encode proteins which function as a first line of defense against pathogens. We call these restriction factors. They are really part of the innate immune system. And interestingly, it is clear that viruses and their hosts are in a constant arms race. That is, restriction factors select for viruses which can escape restriction factors. And conversely, uh, attack by viruses select for newly effective restriction factors in their host. And this story is especially important in understanding zoonosis. So where do viruses come from? How come all of a sudden we have COVID? 20 years ago, we had SARS. Um, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years, yeah, 50 years ago, HIV appeared. These viruses have jumped from animals. They are, their, their ancestors are present in animals and some change in the virus has enabled it to get past the restriction factors and successfully replicate in new hosts such as humans. So this is really important for, this area of research is really important for uh, trying to anticipate the appearance of new viruses. Um, just as any step in the viral replication cycle is a potential target for therapy, any step in the viral replication cycle is a potential target for restriction factors. And in fact, there is a wide variety of restriction factors which block a number of steps in the viral replication cycle. I'll just list several here, although this is not a complete list. And of course, if we knew better how restriction factors work, we might be able to take advantage of that to interfere with viral replication. So again, you remember this. So one step in the replication cycle is entry and there are cellular proteins called ifatems, interferon induced transmembrane proteins that block the entry step. Um, and there is a newly described protein called Syrinc5, which I have been studying along with many other people, which also acts to block the entry step of some retroviruses, including some HIVs. Another step of, call, of course is reverse transcription. Um, and there are a number of cellular proteins, restriction factors, which block this step. So one is TRIM5. Uh, TRIM5 seems to uh, 
form a super lattice on the lattice of viral proteins uh, enclosing the viral RNA plus reverse transcriptase and prevents its proper um, unwind, unwinding, uncoding to produce a uh, proper DNA copy. Uh, this is very interesting story, um, still under very active investigation. Um, another is um, another is FB1. This is really the first restriction factor to be described, and it is mouse specific. It's actually what I studied when I first really got active in the field. Uh, yet another is SAM HD1, which has a completely different mode of action. It uh, keeps the level of DNTPs in the cytoplasm too low for reverse transcription. And finally, APABEC3, um, I think many of you have heard of this. Um, this interferes with DNA synthesis partly by um, inducing massive levels of deamination of cytidines in the minus strand, the first strand of DNA made as RNA is copied into DNA. This results in massive levels of G to A mutation in the plus strand, uh, in the coding strand. Essentially, it destroys the genome by hypermutation. Another restriction factor actually, actually physically gums up the works and blocks the release of uh, fully formed immature virus particles. This was given the nice name of tetherin. Um, okay, and that's all I'm going to say about restriction factors, unless you ask me questions. And I'll just say a word or two about why don't we have an HIV vaccine? It is not for want of trying. Um, really, there have been tremendous efforts going, extending decades now and costing billions of dollars, but there's really been no success in success in designing a vaccine to protect against HIV. Why is that? Well, as I told you, HIV survives and replicates for years in an infected individual, and so it has been selected to evade or hide from the immune system. And so one set of answers to the question, why don't we have an HIV vaccine, is first of all, the proteins on the exterior of the virus are covered with carbohydrates. They're very sparsely distributed on that surface, viral surface. It's difficult for an antibody to bind to it once. And a large fraction of the surface glycoprotein is variable loops whose sequence is not terribly important for the virus. Furthermore, uh, entry is a mm, complex two-step process. So in this little cartoon, I am showing the viral glycoprotein. So this is a trimer of heterodimers and the heterodimers are between GP41, the transmembrane portion of the surface glycoprotein and GP120, the so-called surface component, surface protein in this heterodimer. And it is this GP120 that is displayed on the outside of the virus and is looking for receptors on a new membrane. And so this is what happens if it, if it finds what it's looking for. What it's looking for is CD4. Um, CD4 was called the receptor of the virus. In fact, the CD4 binding site, as it says at the top of the slide, is buried deep within the protein. Furthermore, only after it binds CD4 is the real business end of the protein exposed, namely the part of the protein that binds what was called the co-receptor, CCR5. It is this interaction that is between the viral protein, glycoprotein, and CCR5 that actually triggers very complex rearrangements of the viral glycoprotein, resulting ultimately in membrane fusion. And so the site, the real business end of the virus, is only transiently exposed during the course of infection. And the rest of the time, 
it's covered up. And so HIV, when it is floating around in the blood, it is not displaying this important binding site. Um, and so apparently the body fails to make antibodies against it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is my talk. Um, and uh, I mainly uh, talked about retrovirus research in historical terms and um, talked about some aspects of HIV biology. I'm still happy to answer questions and uh, I am meanwhile displaying this important slide. So uh, any questions? There's a question in the chat box, uh, Dr. Ryan. Taylor, you want to ask it? Uh, Taylor, would you like to ask it by a directly or should I read the... Yeah, that's fine. I can ask it. Um, I was just curious, um, Joshua Wright, you said that the uh, these insertional mutagenesis can occur around um, growth genes, and I'm just wondering if that's because they're constitutively expressed or in open chromatin or um, why that might be. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think there's no real simple answer to the question. I mean, the, what I was trying to tell you was it's just random and sooner or later, um, the insertion will occur in one of those genes. Um, but that answer that I just gave you is something of an oversimplification. Um, and so some, some viruses prefer uh, actively expressed genes um, and they, some, so it, it's really a function of the integrase and different viruses have different integrases. Some are looking for open chromatin, um, actively transcribed genes. Others uh, integrate near the beginnings of transcriptional units um, more specifically, and still others don't seem to exhibit those preferences. Uh, so it's kind of more or less random. Um, but I mean more or less literally. Uh, but anyway, even if it's completely random, eventually it, it lands someplace where it does some damage. Is there any other questions from anyone else? Uh, there is one more in the chat box about, do you think the discovery of the Rau sarcoma virus directed cancer research for a long time uh, by chasing the viral origin of tumors, did it go in the wrong direction because people were chasing the viral origin of tumors? Well, uh, so I... I I mean, one answer to that question is no, it led to oncogenes and oncogenes are a central part of how we understand cancer today. That's one answer. On the other hand, um, around mm, the early 1970s, um, there was a big push, a lot of money spent by NCI looking for viruses causing human tumors. Um, and they were really looking for retroviruses and um, except for HTLV, which I didn't get into at all, um, that's, that's the wrong place to look. And um, retroviruses do not cause human tumors. Um, on the other hand, um, we now understand that some viruses are a major contributor to human tumors, but not retroviruses. So HPV, for example, uh, other small DNA viruses, uh, HTLV, human T cell leukemia virus, which is quite unrelated retrovirus that is, we still don't understand how it causes tumors, um, but that's also important. So was it the wrong place to look? I don't know, uh, maybe. 
What do you think? Uh, I don't know that Maged Zainaldin is still there, uh, but that was his question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, if there's one other question, I have, a, I have a question about the retro transposons. Um, not about the retro viruses, but about the retro transposons, because there are also viruses present in the human genome. So, do you uh, think um, we. I missed what you said. The what? About the retro transposons. Can you hear me okay? Trans retro trans. I can type the question. Retro transposon. Okay. Yeah, yes. Retro uh -huh. Sure. So There's such a huge part of human genome. Do you uh, think moving forward, we'll be making more discoveries and how they're important for human life? Because at this point, most of us believe that they are just the junk DNA reminiscent of some of the, some of the <clears throat> past infections, but then what if they're contributing to the biology more than we actually uh, have found out by now? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I mean, one answer is, is again, why are there dogs and cats? I mean, um, they have managed to, they have succeeded in spreading through the human genome. So they're there um, and apparently they are harmless enough that they don't kill off their host. Um, <clears throat> that, that's one answer. Another answer, as you probably know, is there are some cases where a um, where where they do have a a function, um, but I I think those are mi the minority case. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know more. I don't have a better answer to your question. It's it's a, such an interesting question. I, I think it's an emerging field and Haig Kazazian and Kathy Burns from Hopkins have uh, really made some inroads into how insertion of these retrotransposons could lead to uh, susceptibility or even increase in the intensity of some of the diseases, uh, not necessarily cancer, but certainly there are now slowly emerging stories in cancer as well, where new retrotransposons or old ones, whichever, you know, it in, depends on how many uh, thousands of years they have been in the genome, are able to cause disruptions when they integrate into wrong areas. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Anything else? Uh, other, I don't see any more questions in the chat box, and if none of, if there are no more questions, then let's thank uh, uh, Dr. Ryan for a wonderful talk. Uh, it was very, uh, it was very informative and very helpful talk to understand the entire biology of the retroviruses in the context of the, not only in the context of the diseases we have faced, but also the current disease or the pandemic we are facing. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alan. Okay. <clears throat> thank you.